continue to worship this morning through the reading and preaching and hearing of God's Word. I want to invite you to open your Bibles and turn them to Peter's first epistle. Before we pray, I want to amend my announcement that we had two adult Sunday school classes. We actually have three. There's a young adult class that meets in room 211. So if you consider yourself a young adult, that means you've never seen a rotary phone. You've never memorized a phone number. Um, Then that class is for you. Um, Room 211 upstairs at 1045 following our service. The rest of you experienced people, stay in here with me as we work through the Westminster Confession at 1045. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God in heaven, we pause now to remember those who are in great need. We all are in great need. We all have our own issues, our own hidden secrets the challenges of obedience in our own lives. And then there are those either here today or at home because they can't get up physically who are struggling tremendously with sickness, with disease, with recovery from surgery. They've cried out to you and they've longed for you and they are awaiting you. So we pray for them. We ask you to meet them where they are and pour your grace out in their lives. Be with their caregivers. Bless them with strength and perseverance so that they would show your love to those that they care for. We pray for quick recoveries. We pray for healing. And we ask for fullness in this room as we worship you in the coming weeks and months. Lord, would you help them to return? We pray for those who are not only hurting physically, but they're grieving emotionally. They're suffering, bereavement, a loss. They're wrestling. They're in the depths of despair. Lord, you are the God of all creation. The psalmist says, if I go down to the depths, you are there. Would you show yourself to them, we pray. We pray for those who carry your gospel around the world that you would be with them in a unique way on this Lord's Day, that you would build them up and strengthen their faith and help them to see the fruit of their labor so that they would not lose heart, turn back. They wouldn't be like Lot's wife that longed again for Sodom and Gomorrah. They wouldn't be like the unfaithful farmer who stopped plowing because the way was too rough, there were too many rocks, the soil was unruly. Lord, would you give them hope and strength today and use our gifts to encourage their work and their faith. Help us to be diligent in our prayers for them. Help us to reach out to them, encouraging them with email or text or however we might contact them. Bless the packages that we send to them. May they be used for that purpose. We pray also for our Officials, those in authority over us in these United States, in our own state, and locally in our own community. Lord, would you bless our leaders? We pray for them not because they are necessarily the choice of every one of us, but because you tell us to pray for those in leadership. And so we do. We pray that you would put Christian witness in their midst that they would be swayed by the strength of kingdom presence among them, faithful men that you've put in the halls of justice, that your church might be protected and your kingdom might grow and endure. Lord, would you bless us now as we come to the means of grace, not only the word 
read and heard and preached, but also the table. Would you tend your sheep, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. This is the word of the Lord. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. So we come to 1 Peter 3, the very last few verses of this chapter, and the theme of Peter's epistle has become quite clear now. It's suffering in Christ because of our union with him, Because Christ also suffered. That's how we begin this passage, verse 18. For Christ also suffered. If you have a a Bible that has a concordance or maybe just footnotes, you might have a note beside that verb there, suffered. Some of you might not have the ESV open in front of you, and it might be translated, for Christ also died once for sins. If you note the first point of our outline this morning, you'll see that I've termed it the full gospel, verse 18 is just that. Peter has given us all kinds of accolades because of our relationship with Christ. He's he's actually said expressly that this letter is written to those who have been born again. So if you're not a Christian, if you don't know Christ as Lord, then 1 Peter is going to be really difficult for you to understand because you don't have relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And so what you see in God's word is going to be difficult for you, particularly here in 1 Peter, because he deals with some really weighty stuff. What kind of weight, Scott? Well, he he says that those who are in Christ are, are going to suffer as Christ did. He gives us some really hard instructions to submit to those in authority over us. That's not easy. It's hard to live in submission, but it's a mark of the Christian life, to live in a life of subjection to government authorities, to those who might be in the workplace in authority over us. Peter uses the analogy of slaves and masters. He even introduces these realities into marriage. Wives are to be subject to their husbands, and husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way. Both of those things, both of those things are equally challenging. Some ladies might say, yeah, well, I'd rather have the understanding charge than the subject charge. Trust me, we've been trying to figure out the understanding part for a very long time. Marriage is not easy, and that's why we turn to God's word for instruction, because he breaks us down, whether we are men or women in marriage. He humbles us both to bring us to a place where we can live in humility toward one another. It's not easy. Peter's charges are difficult. But he says then, moving forward in chapter 3, that The summation is all of us are going to suffer. Not that marriage is a life of suffering. Marriage is glorious. If you haven't been married yet, don't think that I'm saying don't get married. I think you should get married. I think you should get married quickly. 
I don't like the trends in our nation that 25, 27, 30 year old is now the median age for marriage. I think it should be younger. I think it's better for you. It was certainly better for me than to burn with lust and passion to to be married, to start a family, to be fruitful and multiply. We've done our best with that. (laughs) My wife can't blush. She's in the nursery. (laughs) Now we come to this reminder, this gospel-centered reminder of what Christ has endured. If we're called to suffer, why? Because Christ did first. So the first point here of the full gospel if you've never heard the gospel, you've heard people talk about the gospel before, but you don't, you don't really know how to define it. I remember as a student minister early on, years ago, asking my students, hey, how would you answer the question, what is the gospel? One of them said, uh, it's God's word. Another said, yeah, yeah, it's the Bible. And, and, that's not the gospel. Here's the gospel right here. The gospel is That Jesus Christ died for sin. He died because sin happened, but he did not sin. Paul teaches us in Romans, the wages of sin is death. So, So Jesus must have been a sinner because he died, right? No. No, he took our wages The payment that we deserved was death. When he, he actually deserved life. So point, sub point of point number one, point one A is that Christ died for sins, not his own. He was the perfect, spotless, blemishless lamb of God. Who, who, like Adam, if Adam had never sinned, if Adam had never eaten the fruit from the tree in Genesis 3, Adam would have lived forever. But the second Adam is greater than the first. He didn't succumb, succumb to the temptations of the enemy in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus lived Perfectly, and gave up his perfection so that he could die for sins. But more specifically, not just for sins, for sinners. Christ had to die in order for life to be purchased. So, so Christ died for sin. Secondly, or point 1B, He suffered one time. Jesus doesn't die every time we come to the table. That's why the reformers struggled so much with the Roman Catholic Mass. This idea that Jesus is is there in real presence being crucified all over again in their places of worship. They have Jesus on the cross, a statue. Jesus is not on the cross anymore. Jesus has defeated the cross and death and the grave. He's risen again. He doesn't need to be killed again and again and again every Lord's Day, every Mass. Christ died once. And the reason why he only had to die once was because of what Peter called his precious blood. His blood, the blood of Christ, the blood of the Son of the living God, very God of very God, the second person of the Trinity. It was his blood that was sufficient. In the Old Testament system of Israel's sacrifices, the blood of, of bulls and goats, they were not sufficient to take away the sins of God's people. They were merely symbolic pointing them to the reality that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, setting the table, if I can say it that way, for Jesus who was to come. Pointing God's people to God's provision through the shed blood of the Lamb 
not the blood of rams and bulls. So God had a plan from the very beginning to whisper through the annals of time how he was going to redeem the world to himself through his son. His son only had to die once because his blood was sufficient. A bull's blood would never redeem you or I. A goat's blood would never redeem Israel. Only the son of the living God, only his blood is sufficient. Only his blood is precious. Only his blood is powerful enough to pay the price of redemption. Point 1C, Christ died once for sins. And the exchange, what I called the title of our sermon this morning, the great exchange. The righteous for the unrighteous, or the, ju- the just for the unjust. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, this is the gospel, he died in your place. You are the unrighteous. I am the unrighteous. He who knew no sin became sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. That's the gospel. This atoning work was done for us by Christ, and it couldn't be accomplished by anyone else. He procured our salvation because he obeyed perfectly. Every day of his life was invested to bring about the righteousness that we could never earn. So that by faith in his finished work at Calvary, we might not put on the garbs of our sin any longer. We, not, we might not put on, you know, even our best efforts at forgiveness, our best merits to earn God's favor. Paul said, even our best works are like filthy rags that women use and then discard. If I can be very clear at what Peter was getting at, or excuse me, what Paul was getting at. In the sight of a holy God, our best efforts are filthy rags. Discarded, wrapped up, thrown away, shoved to the bottom of the trash can, and taken out of the house. We could never earn it. We are laden, burdened with sin. So we, who would eat the fruit, Oh, why did Adam do it? Oh, if you or I were there, we would have taken the fruit. We would have gobbled it up like we had never seen food in the whole month. We would have made the choice to deny our God. We would have made the choice that, that the world has something better for us than obedience to God's commands. We would have done the same thing. And we do the same thing. We were doing the same thing, as Katie just sang, when Jesus set his love upon us. And we would never have loved him had he not done that first. But he did. Paul, again, in Romans says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my king, should die for me? And why? Why did he do this? Point one D, that he might bring us to God. What happened in Genesis 3 was this this great chasm between God and man was formed. 
that could not be crossed by men's efforts, even though he would long to see it, even though he would try to climb that mountain again, he couldn't do it. And so Christ came. Christ came that he might be our bridge to the Father, that he might bring us to God. You and I were made for relationship with the eternal God. We were, that's why we were made. We were made for that. And in order for us to have that, Jesus had to do what he did. And so, when we place our faith in Christ, he miraculously, supernaturally, unites us together again with the one who made us. That we would have, from that day forward, eternal life, relationship with God. Jesus said, now this is eternal life, John 17, 3, that they know you. Now you might think, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't, my relationship with God, I'm not sure what that's like. That's okay. It's called growing in your understanding, in maturity. It's called growing, learning how to relate to the one who made you. And every single Christian, those who call Christ Lord, they little by little learn what relationship with God is, what it looks like, how they nurture it, how we see it and experience it in our lives. That's the whole purpose. This is why Jesus did what he did, to bring us back to himself. Wait a minute, Scott. I thought you just said that he might bring us to God. Jesus is God. So I don't get you too confused and go into a breakdown of the Trinity. We'll move on. But things won't get less confusing, unfortunately, because we move out of verse 18 into verses 19, 20, 21, and 22. If anybody ever asks you, where's the really confusing stuff in God's word? Turn to 1 Peter 3. I would encourage you to read commentaries, but I would be afraid of the commentaries that you would pick up because there's so many different writers saying so many different things about what Peter writes here. So if you're taking notes, write this part in pencil, not in ink. I call it judgment waters. Peter says that Jesus has done this. He set us the example. He suffered. He died. He's done this great supernatural work for us on our behalf. He was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. In which, verse 19, or in whom, I think is a better translation, in the spirit, Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits. He went, past tense, back, past tense, in time. He went at one point in time and he preached to the spirits who are now, present day, they're now in prison. Clear as mud? All right. So, so at, there was a time in the past where Jesus went by the spirit, in the spirit, And preached to those who didn't listen. The bad news of the gospel is some people will hear the gospel preached and they will never respond in faith. They'll say, oh, that's too lofty, that's too, too wild, it's, it's too fantastic for me to believe. Okay, well, then tell me what you do believe. Let's just work your faith out for a moment. How did we get here? Where did that matter come from? Who started it? So I got eyeballs and fingernails and toes from, from that one thing that somehow expanded, exploded maybe in your worldview at some point. Interesting. This is easier for me to believe. So Jesus went in the spirit 
and for claims. Keep your finger there in, first, in chapter 3 for a minute. Turn back to chapter 1. I'm going to remind you what Peter wrote about the prophets back then, back in the past. Verse 10 of chapter 1. Concerning this salvation, the one that we just talked about in verse 18 of chapter 3. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. They wanted to know. They wanted to understand when these things were going to take place. Verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So Peter already has introduced this truth, this idea that it was the spirit of Christ in the life of the prophets who was expanding to God's people the word of God. It's what I love about Reformed theology. One story. Beginning at prior to creation. Ending in the sunset of time, the end of Revelation, when Christ returns. And here we are, somewhere in the middle, in these last days. But looking back now and thinking about what Peter's trying to communicate to us, that, that Christ, in the Spirit, went and proclaimed the gospel to the spirits who are now in prison. Verse 20, because back in chapter 3 now, because they formerly did not obey because they didn't obey back then when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight persons were brought safely through the water that was how many people were on the ark two of every kind except for homo sapiens there was eight of us So God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Christ, in the Spirit, was preaching to the contemporaries of Noah through the construction process. When you go back and you read the account of God and that story and how it all shook out, if you've ever built anything like I'm building now, my shed I've been working on for quite some time, brings me great comfort. It took Noah like 126 years to build the ark. So I'm comforted some that a year and a half roughly in, my shed's not finished yet still. Although that argument doesn't work with my wife, by the way. For anything, not just the shed. But can you imagine how much suffering, how much ridicule, how much just scoffing took place during the days of Noah while Noah was building the ark, making his proclamation that rain was going to come and flood the earth and that they needed to repent and that they needed to board the ark with him. Can you imagine how much he suffered because of his faith in the word of God by the spirit of Christ that had been delivered to him? So Peter's just saying, By the inspiration of the same Spirit that Christ has proclaimed to the same spirits who are now in prison, way back then, he proclaimed to them the truth that they needed to believe and trust in the promise of God. And in that day, it was the ark. In our day, it's the cross. God made a way where there was no way. In Noah's day, he did it through the obedience of a man for 126 years to build an ark of wood. Eight persons were brought safely through the water. Now, don't pull me aside after our sermon this morning and say, well, wait a minute, Scott, are you saying that Jesus went to hell and, you know, kind of paraded in front of the face of those who rejected him? millennia ago I don't know I think that's what Peter's saying but I'm not sure 
And I wouldn't use those words to describe what Peter is saying Jesus did here. I think everything that is eternal, which is God, the word of God, and the souls of men, I think all of those things are on display all the time to eternal beings. I think we see this in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. I think the ones that are experiencing the wrath of God in hell can still see the revelation of God taking place in real time and space here. And I think those in heaven, the great cloud of witnesses that we read about in our call to worship this morning, that we're surrounded by, Hebrews chapter 12, I think they can see it too. So yes, I think Jesus went and proclaimed way back then, and I think that the spirits that are now in prison somehow possibly could have borne witness to that even when Christ accomplished what he did at Calvary. Verse 21, baptism, Peter goes on, which corresponds to this now saves you. Now let's think about it for a minute. What is this correspondence that he's talking about? Well, he's just brought up Noah. He's brought up the boat and how long it took for it to be prepared. He's brought brought up the suffering that, that was taking place then. Those who didn't obey, did not believe, didn't trust in the preaching of Noah, the display of his life. By the way, those same people, they, were, they grasped at the ark. Moses writes, trying to get in as the floodwaters rose. You don't want to be those people. You don't want to be the people that are shut out of the grace of God because of unbelief. So repent, turn to Christ, trust in him. Because it was God's promises through the ark that delivered Noah and his sons and their wives. And that baptism of them through the waters of judgment upon the earth corresponds to our baptism today. Those waters that that we pour over those who believe and over the children of those who believe, they symbolize not just the cleansing of sin, they also symbolize the judgment of God upon the earth. Judgment that we are now delivered from through faith in Christ and we are being baptized just like Noah and his family were brought through the waters. We, in baptism, are brought through the waters. We see the same symbolism in Moses, excuse me, in, in uh, Exodus, leaving Egypt, passing through the waters of the Red Sea on dry land, but yet judgment waters still upon the people of Egypt, upon the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. Yes. The waters of our baptism point to several beautiful weighty, heavy things. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. That's not what we're talking about. But as an appeal to God for a good conscience. What we are saying we want when we're expressing faith in Christ Baptize me, pour the water over me. I want to be saved from the judgment of God. I want to be transferred into the kingdom of light. I want my unrighteousness to be accounted for at Calvary. And I want his righteousness to be clothed. I want to be clothed with it. When we're saying these things, that's what we're saying at baptism. That's what we're believing. That's what we are attesting to. That's what we're proclaiming. I'm identifying with Jesus. His waters can wash me clean. I don't want to be under his judgment. I want to be under his grace. I 
I don't want to live in the guilt and the shame of my prior sins. I want to be forgiven. I don't want to be weighted and tied down and enslaved to a life of sin. I want to be free. I want to be able to obey. You can only do that through the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You will never obey the commands of God without the Spirit of God. So you have to have a good conscience. You have to know that, that you're forgiven. That Jesus has separated you from your sins. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west. That's his promise to us. Because he has defeated sin and death through his resurrection. God looked at the payment that Christ made and he said, it is enough. His blood is more than sufficient for the sins of the elect. And Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. Jesus who suffered. Jesus who was ridiculed. Jesus who was mocked. Just like Noah. Just like when the Spirit of God preached, excuse me, the Spirit of Christ preached through Noah for 126 years, mocked and slandered and disregarded. You will be too. We've understood the gospel, hopefully. We've recognized the judgment of God and the symbolic waters of baptism, hopefully. Now we come to this reality that slandering continues. Until Christ returns again, you and I, more and more, through our proclamation, by our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, we will be disregarded. We will be shut off. We will be small-minded, little, petty Christians. Or worse, we'll be Christian nationalists. We'll be militant Christians that abuse and don't report it, that are twisted, and that allow those kinds of things to continue and be maintained. I can tell you unequivocally on behalf of the session here at this particular church and myself, we will not stand for it. No matter what it costs, no matter who it is, no abuser will be sheltered here. But yet they will accuse us of that. And much worse. And so our lives should be not, not about trying to position ourselves politically so that we're always right. Let me help you with something. My heart breaks for both parties. We're so divided. We're so right and they're so wrong, whoever they is. We are marked by one name, and it's not America. It's Jesus. And the life that he lived was full of suffering. And we will suffer too. You'll be ostracized. You won't be invited back. You'll be discounted. You'll be called slow, old-fashioned, All kinds of things. Noah was. Jesus was. We will be. And between now and when we die or the Lord returns, the power of the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is sufficient enough for you and for me. Can you imagine what they said about Peter? Aren't you the one who denied Christ? Aren't you the one who said you never knew him? You were scared of some servant girls around the fire? And now here you are in the halls of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 2, preaching the name of Jesus? How, who are you? You denier? 
Can you imagine what Satan whispered in his ear? How he was slandered, not just for his faith, but for his mistakes. We will be too. But the resurrection power that raised Christ from the grave is also available and will raise us as well. That's the hope of the gospel. That's the truth of the gospel, is that just like Christ was raised, we will be too. And if he wasn't raised, if it's not true, then we of all people, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, are the most to be pitied. But it is true. He is in heaven. He is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him, and we will see it one day in fullness. To that end, we pray. Bow with me. Lord Jesus, we long. We, we cry out, Maranatha, come quickly. We believe that you are the supreme king of all the earth. You're the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And there's a lot in your word, Lord, that we, we don't understand fully. And we look into the future and we think we have an idea of how things are going to play out, but we're not sure. And that's okay. There's one thing we are sure of. You reign you win and we want to be yours we want to be your co-heirs your younger brothers and sisters we want to be your children adopted into your family called your sons and daughters would you build up faith within us? I pray for anyone this, here, this morning here who has never understood the gospel clearly until today, Lord, that you would give them boldness and courage to confess Christ. Have them come and meet with me, meet with another elder. Have them come and, and make their plea that they want to trust in Christ. They want to be his and known by him forever. Would you call salvation to spring up from the ground to that end, we pray in Christ's name, amen.